I receive many questions regarding display calibration and color management. What I have done is gathered the top five questions asked in the comment section, and I'm going to answer them in this video. If you have a question that's not being answered here, please leave them in the comment section below. I'll make sure to answer your question and possibly I may be using your question in a future Q&A video like this. The other thing too is that I want to thank you all of you who have hit that subscribe button on my channel. It really helps out a lot. Right now, when I release this video, we are probably going to be at around 2300 subscribers, which is really amazing. My most recent release video was about the X-Rite i1 Photo Pro 3 Plus. This is a color spectrophotometer. And this is a precursor to a lot of things that are coming, which means I'm gonna do a lot more content regarding printing on this channel. So we have a lot of great content pack that is coming up. So make sure that you subscribe to my channel for that. I'm Art and Art is Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. So this is the most frequently asked question on all of my display calibration video. The short answer to this question is no, you don't need to go in and set up any ICC profile before you run a display calibration. So let's first talk about a software calibrated display. This is most of the display that we have, the one that's built into your laptop, the iMac or all-in-one desktop PC display. These are all software calibrated display, including many of the standalone external displays too. For these type of display, you'll be using the device manufacturer software. This means that if you have an X-Rite device, you'll be using either the i1 Profiler or the i1 Studio to do the display calibration. And if you have a Spider, you'll be using the Data Color Spider software to do the software calibration on these displays. The thing is that when you start the calibration with any of these software, the program will automatically go into your system preferences in the background and apply what they call a linear profile to your display. That means that there are no signal manipulations whatsoever coming out from the video card. So the colors that are gonna be flashing on your screen will be whatever the video card can produce. And then afterwards, these program would then create an ICC profile that remaps this color as close to the reference value as possible. On a hardware calibrated display, the same thing, you don't need to go in and set your system ICC profile. But for example, on the BenQ SW display, you don't even need to go in and choose any specific hardware color mode because Palette Master Element is automatically going to put your display into the correct calibration slot based on the slot that you choose when you calibrate using Palette Master Element. After the calibration, these programs will automatically set the display or the computer to use the ICC profile that is just recently generated. So once you're done with the calibration, you don't need to go in and set the ICC profile either. It is always a good idea to check though, to go into your system preferences or Windows display setting and check to make sure that you are using the correct ICC profile before you do color critical work. This is especially important if you're running on a portable system like I have, for example, a laptop with an external display. Every time you disconnect and reconnect the display, I would probably go in to double check and making sure that the system is still using the correct ICC profile. At some point, you're gonna be confident that the system doesn't really change the ICC profile and you can not check it quite as frequently, but until that happens, I would just double check to make sure that you're using the correct one. So with regards to display brightness, I always give a range in all of my calibration video of anywhere between 80 to 120 candela. And this works great for any type of creative work that you do. If you print for photography, if you don't print in photography, if you do video work, if you do graphic design work, because it is a great baseline. The reason why I give that range is so that you can choose the range of brightness that best suit your working environment and your own personal preferences. I know some photographers who prefer to work at 120. Personally for me, I prefer to work at 80, but I also know many others who prefer to work at 100 candela. This way you have a range that you can choose from, but going anywhere brighter than that, what you're gonna see is a picture that looks great in your display and it will print out dark. This is a follow-up question that I always receive after I recommend the brightness range of the display. And the short answer to that is yes, you should still probably set your display to anywhere between 80 to 120 candela. And the reason why, even though if you're not doing printing at all, at some point you may be printing something. So it's always best to edit your photo for the longevity of the whole lifespan of the photo so that you don't have to come back and re-edit the photo necessarily for printing. You may tweak it here and there, but 
Having to come back in and we tweak the photo in its entirety so that you can get a good for print is not really an efficient use of, you know, any professional's time for that matter. The other thing too is that you can set your display to a brightness greater than 120. You can run it at 200 nits or whatever you choose to, especially if you're not doing printing. However, if you really consider the screens that are out there, there's really no standard to them. For example, your phone. Many times your phone will go brighter or darker depending on the environment and the ambient light that's in. If you have True Tone turned on on your phone or on your laptop for that matter, what's gonna happen is that it's also going to sense the ambient light in the room and constantly change the display white point to match that too. If you have Night Shift turned on, that can also shift the color on the display to reduce blue light, so on and so forth. So you really start to see that there's really no standards for majority of the mobile content consumption devices out there. And when you run the edit on your machine, it's probably best to edit to a standard baseline. And I will tell you right now that even if you don't print, the baseline brightness for printing is still probably one of the best to stick to at this point in time. This is a topic of discussion I can spend hours on, but in short, stick with D65, especially if you're new to printing or new to display calibration. I know that there are many conflicting information out there. Some lab recommends that you calibrate your display to D65. Some recommends that you calibrate your display to D50, and it gets really confusing at times. So this is why I'm telling you now, stick with D65 for the time being. There are a few reasons why you want to stick with this value. Number one is that at 6,500 Kelvin, our eyes see the most color at this spectrum. So that means that when we're editing our photos, we can see fully what we are editing on our screen and we can perceive all those colors. When you go down to D50, your eyes start to see some of the colors not as well anymore. And that's the reason why you want to stick with your primary editing on a D65 display. The other thing too is that for all the displays that are out there, most of them are gonna be tablets or phones, for example, something like this that are used for content consumption. Well, they're all calibrated from the factory at D65. So when you're editing on your screen at D65, when somebody is consuming your content on the web, on your website, whatever that may be, they're going to be viewing on a device to have the screen that's calibrated to D65 as well. This way, what you're seeing on your screen should closely match what they're seeing on theirs. And this is another reason why you should stick to that. If you do a lot of printing and if you're a seasoned printer and you have a inkjet printer in your home and you want to calibrate your display to D50, there's nothing wrong with that. You can certainly do it. Personally for me, what I find more important in calibrating your display to D50 for majority of us out there that are not doing printing professionally is to get a lamp like this. It does look like a Pixar lamp, I know. This lamp, but Pixar lamps are really copyrighted, so we're not going to use that. This is a lamp that I got from Amazon. It's super cheap, it's about 15 bucks, and in here is a light bulb, 100 watt light that is calibrated to D65. This is an LED light bulb, that's pretty much it. So if you use a D65 light bulb, the lighting that you're using to viewing your prints is going to match with the white point that you have your display calibrated to. And this is going to eliminate a lot of color mismanagement issues that you have regarding your display looking one way and your print looking another way. This is one quick way and a fairly cheap option that's probably maybe about $30 to $40 to match the color of the what you're seeing on your display to the prints that you have. Again, as I mentioned before, if you have a specific reason why you want to use D50 or if you're a seasoned professional, you have done this for a long time and you want to use D50, it's perfectly fine. The other reason too why many labs or many places recommend D50, especially when printing, because if you look at a paper white, especially in an inkjet printer, it's never really true white, especially the papers without any optical brighteners. So that's why they recommend calibrating the D50 because that white is a little bit warmer and it's going to match close to the print. But again, that can easily be eliminated with a D65 light source as I just showed you. So this last question is probably one of the more common misconceptions in color management. The short answer to this is no, you don't have to calibrate your display to sRGB in order to maintain a full end-to-end -end sRGB color workflow. And understanding what I'm about to explain to you why will make sense in just a moment. The whole premise is this. If you capture a picture from your camera, whether that's RAW or JPEG, what you do then is tag the file from that camera with sRGB. The understanding is that you should calibrate your display to sRGB, work in an sRGB workflow, 
export that file, tag it with its RGB so that you can upload it to the web so that anybody viewing that will also see the same color in its RGB too. The whole basic premise is that, yes, you can do it that way. However, that's really not necessary because of one thing. And this is on both Mac and PC. On your computer, there is a program called the CMM, the Color Management Module. It is a program that's always running in the real time, in background, doing live color conversions. So what that really means is that if you have a file that's tagged with sRGB, and let's say you're editing on a hardware calibrated display or a wide color gamma display in general, but in this situation, I'm using the BenQ SW270C. This is a hardware calibrated display, and this has been calibrated to panel native as an RGB primary, so really large color space. Well, what's really happening here is that the CMM is going to see that your file is tagged with sRGB, and what it's going to do is change those colors to the display profile and then afterwards is going to do one more conversion and literally showing you the pictures on your screen that's supposed to be representative of the sRGB color space. This way, you don't really have to go in and calibrate your display to sRGB, but if you choose to, you can, but again, it's really not necessary because CMM is constantly doing a color conversion in the background for that. And I have a demo here with two Lightroom instances running side by side. So the one on the left, this is the raw file, the NEF, and this is tagged with Adobe RGB. The one on the right is tagged with sRGB. This is an exported JPEG. You will see right away that the color looks fairly different, especially in the greens and the blues. The sRGB one is less saturated green, less saturated blue, and that's perfectly fine because if you really want to see how your picture is going to look like in sRGB, well, you can simply go in and apply soft proofing in Lightroom. And as you can see right now, the pictures on the left and on the right looks fairly identical to each other. In fact, they look really close. And I would probably think that they are, they are the same picture. But you can see there that even if you use an sRGB workflow on a white color gamma display, what you're seeing all the time with an sRGB photo is that you're seeing the correct color at any given instance. I can show you another sample photos too. In fact, I have four samples to show you. This is another one of the ice field in Iceland. And you can see right there that with soft proofing applied sRGB, the one on the right looks exactly the same as the one on the left with the soft proofing applied. The moment I take that out, we can see right away that the blue gets a slight more saturated and also the orange in the sky is much more saturated. But the moment I apply soft proofing to it, you're really going to see the sRGB outcome of that photo right away. Again, this is a very similar situation of a portrait as well. So for instance, this is with soft proof of flight. And in fact, if I take soft proofing out this one, you may see some slight changes in the green and in the metal, but it's very little. Then the moment I apply back to it, it's the same. But one of the better example of a portrait is that I've shot um, one of my friend here, Patrice, on a blue backdrop, and you can see the differences well, not so much right now because I have soft proofing apply, but if I take soft proofing out, you can see the differences in the blue with the one on the left versus the one on the right right away. And if I go in and apply soft proofing, you can see that the blue now matches in the exact same way. So this is telling you that you don't really have to calibrate your display to sRGB in order for any of these to work. The other thing too is that you always have to remember that if you have a software calibrated display, Generally, once those display have been calibrated from the factory, there's really no way to calibrate it into another color space. So most of the time, you'll be calibrating your display in DCI-P3 or Display-P3 color space anyway, or based on that RGB primer in general. Another thing to keep in mind. And lastly, if you're running in a program such as Lightroom, throughout the entire Lightroom program, it uses Profoto RGB as the primary color space. And it's a color space that's even larger than Adobe RGB. When you're in develop module, it uses Melissa RGB, but as you can see right here, all these color conversions running in the background through the CMM and is making everything work. And here's one more bit of information. If you are using Adobe product, Adobe has their own color engine that runs in the background called Ace. Adobe Color Engine is doing all the color conversion in real time as you see right now. I'm demonstrating this on Ace, but again, it's one of those things that just happen in real time and you don't really have to think about it at all. So I hope that you find the answer to these top five questions helpful. If you have any questions about anything discussed here or a question that I didn't cover here, please leave them in the comment section below. Give this video a like, subscribe if you're new, hit on the bell to be notified every time I upload cool new great contents like this. And until next time, art is right.